Thanks, Branch. Thank you very much. And uh, it's great to be here in Philadelphia. Um, as Branch mentioned, uh, my current position uh, at University College London largely involves the use of transcranial uh, magnetic stimulation in studies of attention and spatial cognition in the healthy human brain. And everything I'm going to talk about today uh, centers around what I think is a fairly simple but ultimately quite challenging framework for cognitive neuroscience. On the one hand, the work that I do uh, is in the experimental domain, experimental TMS research, where we, we use TMS to interfere with normal cortical processing in healthy individuals, with the aim being to reveal normal mechanisms of attention, spatial cognition, etc. On the other hand, as some of you may be uh, familiar with here, uh, TMS can also be used in the clinical domain uh, to interfere with pathological cortical activity uh, that ar arises following brain injury. And TMS is, is gaining prominence in this domain uh, as a mechanism of encouraging plasticity. Now, the crucial, the crucial aspect of these two areas of research, I think, lies in the, in the link between them. And this is, some, this is a theme I'll uh, return to uh, as we go along. But I think it's important at the outset to emphasize the, the importance of this particular link here, where research um, in normal, healthy individuals using TMS is used to motivate rehabilitation techniques um, with the same technique. It's important that there's, there's crosstalk uh, in this direction. And in turn, the outcome of, of TMS clinical research can be used to motivate uh, experimental work using TMS. So we can start then to design questions in the basic research that will more closely link in with potential clinical uh, uh, applications. And I think it's through this cyclical uh, communication that, uh, that the future of this approach lies. And I'm going to return uh, to this slide uh, toward the end. Um, this being the case, the talk I want to give today has four main sections. In the first section, I want to focus on what we know about neural mechanisms of selective spatial attention in the normal healthy brain, uh, and in particular, the contribution of transcranial magnetic stimulation to understanding spatial processing, uh, as some people have called it, the, the virtual lesion approach. I'm then going to talk about TMS uh, as a, an instrument or an intervention for rehabilitating attentional dysfunction. Uh, and I'm going to summarize some of the current and recent progress uh, in treating deficits of attention and spatial cognition that accompany brain injury, and in particular uh, unilateral neglect. I think it's then it's important for us to stand back for a moment and consider some of the limitations of, of cl clinical TMS research in this field uh, and some of the caveats that apply, which then I think leads nicely into the kinds of future approaches and challenges that we might want to consider in this, in this area. Uh, <coughs> so to start, Selective attention. This painting by uh, Hieronymus Bosch, the, uh, the uh, forefounder, I suppose, of surrealist art, I think it illustrates what we all kind of know about attention. We all have a general idea of what attention is. There's far more information in this, in this image than you can process at one time. And so therefore, you have to attend to various points uh, of interest in the display. And it's believed we, we have constructed the so-called spotlight metaphor. Uh, Mike Posner, in particular, has been instrumental in, in this uh, way of formulating attention, where in the brain and in the visual system, perhaps this picture looks more like this, where the area that you are attending receives preferential processing and areas that are unattended are suppressed. And we, we now believe that this spotlight can rove around uh, independently of eye movements in a complex scene um, to enable efficient spatial selection. Now that all sounds good, but I think the best way to, to bring across the concept of attention is through a demonstration. So you're going to be my subjects for this experiment. I'd like you to fixate on this cross and uh, don't make any eye movements away from the cross. I'm going to show you two images in rapid succession. And I'd like you to put your hand up if you can see any change between the two images. Okay, so we're going to do this now, fixating on the cross. Okay, so we've got two people. Now, don't say what you saw. Okay, now, this time we're going to do the same thing. But, and I'd like you to fixate on the cross again. 
this time I'd like you to attend to where the arrow is pointing covertly. So don't make an eye movement to the end of the arrow, just uh, attend covertly. And we'll do exactly the same thing again. So I'm guessing most or if not all of you saw it this time. I think th this of course is the phenomenon of change blindness where, where upon a really large change in a visual scene can be, un can be undetected and go undetected, undetected because there's so much, so, many, so much other noise in the system. But attention has the effect of prioritizing the sensory input. So if we go back a couple of slides here to the original, um, the, the original picture, you can see now that change, there's, there's an entire mountain range disappearing and reappearing over here, uh, which attention has prioritized. I think this is a nice demonstration of how we can use, a, use attention in complex scenes to select information from specific spatial locations. Now, of course, in a laboratory, we have many tasks that we can use to measure those sorts of selective spatial uh, mechanisms. And, to, and I'd like to talk to you about uh, one specific example of an experiment that we've conducted and the type of task that we use. This is a covert orienting paradigm, which many of you may be familiar with. Uh, the subject begins by fixating centrally on this cross and they maintain fixation throughout the experimental trial and eye movements are monitored during this task to ensure that subjects are actually following that instruction. The display consists of four placeholders uh, on either side of the fixation point and on every trial two of those placeholders are illuminated very briefly um, by changing them from black to white. The subject's instructed to ignore this irrelevant cue. This cue tells them nothing about the task. They're told to ignore this cue. A target then occurs randomly in one of those placeholders. And it can occur uh, randomly on the left or the right side or in an upper or lower location. And the subject simply decides uh, after a mask is presented, in this case a backward mask, uh, did the target occur in an upper or lower location, irrespective of whether it occurred on the left or right side of the display. This is what you, we would call a validly queued trial because even though this queue is irrelevant to the task, in this particular case it predicted or it occurred on the same side as the upcoming target. If however the target had occurred on the opposite side, we would call this an invalidly queued trial. And it's this critical manipulation of queue validity that gives us a powerful behavioral effect known as a queuing effect. Basically, uh, the accuracy of performance in this task is improved on validly queued trials relative to invalidly queued trials. And if it's a speeded task involving reaction time, people are faster on validly queued trials relative to invalid trials. Even though that queue is completely irrelevant, this is a reflexive shift of attention. So how does this work? Well, it, the spotlight metaphor um, tells us that in this task, what's most likely happening is that on a validly queued trial, attention is queued to the correct location, yielding a particular uh, uh, level of accuracy and or reaction time. But on an invalidly queued trial, so in this case the queue occurring on the right and the target occurring on the left, subjects need to reorient their attention from the, the queued location to the target location. And this reorienting effect causes, costs you time and neural resources and leads to essentially a deficit, an attentional deficit. So by the time your attention has got to this location, uh, if the target is presented briefly and masked, you'll have less evidence in order to make your decision and so you are less accurate and you are slower. We know from uh, a long history of neuropsychological research that patients who have parietal injury uh, show extreme deficits of reorienting attention. This is um, data from one of the earliest, I think, demonstrations of reorienting impairments uh, following parietal and perhaps frontal injury by Posner, Walker, Friedrich and Rafal. Uh, they performed a very similar task to this in their subjects and um, they showed that even though there was uh, queuing effects for both targets presented in the left and the right hemifield, there was a particularly salient uh, cost of invalid queuing when a target was presented in the neglected field, in this case the left hemifield. Um, suggesting that this, uh, this is a deficit of disengaging attention from ipsy lesional space and reorienting attention to contralesional space. Now, the, the neuropsychological approach uh, has many advantages uh, and, and strengths, but it's important, I think, for us to consider some of the limitations. Uh, in particular, as you saw from the previous slide, lesions uh, typically are very large. 
um, patients uh, undergo extensive reorganization and cortical plasticity following a lesion, which can obviously make it difficult to draw conclusions in a normal population based on a patient group. Obviously, a stroke is not predictable, so we don't have behavior prior to the lesion. And it's also, I think, important for us to note that patients typically provide fairly variable results, which in the previous graph, you can see one of the things you may have noticed was that the standard error in the critical condition where patients had to reorient their attention to the neglected uh, hemifield it was significantly higher than all of the other conditions. And this can create statistical difficulties in, uh, in drawing conclusions based on patient data. For this reason, transcranial magnetic stimulation has emerged as a complementary approach, not a replacement of neuropsychology, but a complementary approach, where in healthy subjects, we can stimulate discrete regions of the cortex, focally, safely, and reversibly to disrupt cortical activity, um, thus causing, uh, if, if you like, a virtual lesion of a small area. Uh, and the advantage, one of the great advantages of TMS is that subjects can actually serve as their own controls. So we can undertake repeated measures designs. Now I understand um, many of you have, are familiar with TMS, but it's worth spending just a moment talking a little bit about the physics. During TMS, um, a high strength current is passed through a copper winding, which induces a magnetic field orthogonal to the axis of the current. This magnetic field in turn induces an electric field in any material that conducts electricity. In this case, of course, neurons in the brain. Um, the electric field passes across pyramidal axons, in this case shown in the precentral gyrus, and causes depolarization of neurons. And this depolarization of neurons can have a variety of effects, uh, not just effects on behavior, but of course if we stimulate uh, motor cortex, we can get muscle twitches, or we can get changes in uh, blood flow and metabolism as recorded through, uh, for example, fMRI and uh, EEG. So you can see that TMS activates neurons and the effects on behavior can be uh, wide ranging from suppressing or enhancing perception, uh, eliciting phosphenes if you deliver TMS over the visual cortex. It can alter cortical excitability by either suppressing or enhancing it. Uh, and it can also uh, tell us about neural connectivity. And of course, it has clinical applications, which I will uh, get to in a little while. The origins of TMS, uh, even though it's fairly recent, it has been around for a long time. I'm sure this is a slide you've all seen before, but I, I just love it. Uh, back in the uh, early part of the 20th century, uh, nobles, it turned out, would like to place their heads within large DC coils <laughs> and um, report on what they saw. This is an example of one such noble. This is actually, I, I believe, a publication in the journal Science. So. Um, this is maybe what you had to do back then to get into science. But uh, uh, in 1989, uh, Amasian were the first to use TMS uh, in cognitive neuroscience uh, to explore the role of visual cortex in uh, sensory processing. And so we've gone from this now to this. And that, that's the type of TMS I'm talking about today. Um, it's also worth uh, anticipating a, a question that I'm often asked, which is how focal is TMS? Uh, and focality of TMS depends almost entirely on coil geometry. Uh, the figure of eight coil shown here has been designed because it emits a conical uh, a magnetic field and induces a conical electric field in the cortex, which can activate anything between 0.5 centimeters cubed to 3 centimeters cubed of neural tissue. Uh, it's an approximation, obviously, because we don't have the ability to determine these uh, numbers uh, directly. So it's, it's of sufficient focality, uh, it's believed, to isolate fairly specific regions of cortex and their role in behavior, as I'll show you in a moment. Disruptive effects of TMS uh, in an event-related design, or otherwise known as an online design, can, I think, be best understood as adding noise to neural signals, thus lowering the signal-to-noise ratio. Uh, so, for example, a subject is presented with the letter A and, TM and no TMS is delivered. Uh, we can idealize this, of course, as a neural signal, which leads to an intact percept of the letter A. Uh, if, however, we do the same thing, but we deliver t a TMS pulse to the occipital lobe, we're essentially adding noise to that signal, leading to a degraded percept. In this way, of course, TMS can also tell us about the time course of processing. Uh, if we deliver a single pulse at various times after the onset of this letter A, uh, we can uh, ex determine when this region of brain is necessary particular for a particular function, not just which area, but when in the neural, neural time course. For example, if the TMS 
is delivered 0 to 90 milliseconds after ox uh, onset of the uh, target over the occipital cortex. The percept is intact. If, it's, if it is delivered 100 to 120 milliseconds after, the percept is degraded and then perception returns to normal if the TNS pulse is delivered later in time. So this would tell us that that region of the occipital lobe is necessary uh, for uh, perception of that letter between 100 to 120 milliseconds after target onset. So TMS can tell us about the neural chronometry, if you like, of processing. So I want to talk now about a specific experiment that exploited um, this aspect of TMS um, that we conducted to determine uh, which areas of the brain are necessary for reorienting attention. Uh, synonymous, I suppose, with the disengage deficit uh, that Posner and colleagues reported in 1984. We used the same task that I showed you at the outset where um, pa participants uh, attended to a central fixation cross. A cue was then presented randomly on the left or the right, which they were instructed to ignore, and then a target in one of these four placeholders, which was subsequently masked. And TMS was delivered at one of 12 times after target onset in order to disrupt the ability to reorient attention between the cue and target locations. And this paradigm yields two critical predictions. The first is that if the area that we're disrupting is necessary for reorienting attention, then TMS should not affect target detection on valid trials because your attention is already where it needs to be. You've been cued to the correct side of space and the target occurs on the same side, so there's no need to reorient attention, so TMS should have no effect if that area is specifically involved in reorienting attention. On the other hand, on an invalid trial where attention must be shifted from the cued side to the target location, uh, TMS should further impair target perception on these trials. So th there's a pre-existing deficit, if you like, on these trials, and TMS should make that deficit even greater because it's only on these trials that you need to reorient your attention. Are you coming in on the right or the left? Randomly. Okay. We stimulated four regions of the parietal cortex uh, the angular gyrus and supramarginal gyrus of the right hemisphere and the same corresponding regions of the left hemisphere. So we were focusing in particular on the uh, inferior parietal lobule and its role in reorienting attention. And of course, as many of you will know, these areas are considered to be uh, imp uh, important areas of lesion damage in, in neglect and other syndromes. So I'm going to show you the results now. I'm going to put them together in stages. Now the only brain area uh, that we found necessary for attention was the angular gyrus in the right hemisphere. And the results I'm going to show you are plotted according to the TMS onset time after target onset and simply the proportion of correct answers that subjects were able to give in terms of whether the target occurred in an upper or lower location. First, valid trials. Now, we predict that nothing will happen on valid trials because there's no need to, sh to reorient attention. And indeed, this is what we found. Um, TMS delivered at any one of these times did not significantly... Uh, change performance. So it didn't inf influence perf performance just on the visual task independent of attention. But of course the critical condition is the invalid trials uh, where we found an interesting pattern of effects. Not only was this area necessary for reorienting attention but it was necessary at two times after target onset at an early time from 90 to 120 milliseconds and a later time 210 to 240 milliseconds. So there appears to be a biphasic pattern if you like in this brain area. So crucially, it wasn't necessary at the intervening times. Instead, it was crucial for reorienting attention early and late. Now, so th there, there are two conclusions we can draw from this result. The first is that the angular gyrus is necessary for, for reorienting or disengaging attention. Uh, and this is synonymous with the disengaged deficits shown by Posner and others in parietal lesion patients. And also, secondly, uh, these two periods of attentional processing in the right AG. And we can speculate what this might reflect. And one possibility is that, in fact, these reflect the uh, activity of two independent visual pathways into the inferior parietal cortex, a fast retinotectal pathway uh, that proceeds via the superior colliculus and pulvinar and therefore bypasses complex processing in the visual cortex, which may uh, be arriving at around 90 to 120 milliseconds and a slower geniculostriate input to ventral parietal cortex um, via the lateral geniculate nucleus, V1, V5, and so forth. Obviously, this takes more time 
because more complex processing occurs. And it could be that that's what's actually happening at this later period. This is a speculation, of course, which needs confirmation. But it's, it's, it raises an interesting hypothesis that, in fact, uh, only TMS can really tell us, which is that uh, a, sing a single discrete region of parietal lobe can be necessary at multiple times for the same behavioral function. I'll repeat the question, yeah. Okay, so the, the question is whether uh, these two periods might reflect uh, actual different attentional functions um, as opposed to different inputs on the s for the same function. Uh, and that's a definite possibility. I mean, um, w one of the speculations, the other speculations we made was that perhaps um, this period uh, reflected disengagement of attention from the Q location and this period reflected some form of re-engagement or complex processing at the target location. Um, and it's, that's, that explanation would not be inconsistent with a uh, neurophysiological explanation based on two pathways because it could be indeed that this retinotectal input is necessary for that disengagement. And then therefore it, you can imagine a feedback system which primes visual cortex uh, for the more complex information that comes through at a slower rate. This again is a speculation. Anjan. So the first question is uh, how does, how does their, their focus on SPL uh, relate to our focus on the IPL? And the second question is, uh, how do we relate reaction time deficits to accuracy deficits? In the context of interpreting this as a disengaged, as a disengaged deficit. Um, to, address your, to address your first question, uh, I think it's, it's true that with lesion patients, we can find multiple areas of the parietal lobe that can yield these types of deficits. Um, and uh, there is quite a bit of controversy, I think, out there as to which areas perhaps are singularly critical for specific functions. They, I know, I'm aware, they, they emphasize superior, superior parietal, as, as, do, uh, as do other investigators, for example, in extinction. Um, but on the other hand, of course, there are those such as Mort who emphasize the angular gyrus as being central for neglect. Um, so I think um, we, have to, we have to probably acknowledge that there are multiple regions in the parietal cortex that are necessary for, for attentional function. I think SPL is certainly one of them. Uh, we didn't include an SPL site here because we selected these sites primarily, I think, on the basis of uh, a model by Corbetta and Schulman, which argues that the inferior regions are more likely to belong to a ventral front frontoparietal network that is important for reflexive shifts of attention, which is, of course, what we're manipulating here. But even if that's true, there is other evidence that yeah. SPL is involved. Anyway, I, I think it, a lot of the controversy may... Uh, be unnecessary, in fact. I think we can probably consider most of these areas are important for these sorts of functions. The challenge is working out, I think, maybe the uh, degree of parcellation, of spe specialization. Now, to answer your second question, um, yes, we can, in, their, in their, uh, their paper and in many attention papers, including our own, uh, reaction times are considered to be the, the best or primary measure of attention. But of course, it's a flip side of the same coin. If you're slower at something, in a supra-threshold design, you're likely to be less accurate in a thresholded level design. So in this particular design, subjects were thresholded. As you can see, their baseline here is at about 85% correct. Um, now, if you consider that the displays were time-limited, where targets were presented very briefly, any disengaged deficit will mean you have less time to process that target, which will then have a, an effect on accuracy. Um, if, if we'd measured this in terms of reaction time in a supra-threshold design, you would essentially predict the reverse graph where you get two peaks rather than two troughs. It's interesting. Uh, that's interesting, yeah. Yeah, I suppose that's one way of looking at it. That, that with a reaction time design, you know that they've responded to the target um, and they're slower. But I could, I could, I could argue maybe the same thing, that, that statistically you have a deficit of a spatial shift in a reaction time design which makes you slower and or you have a deficit in a disengage mechanism. I actually think maybe it's not possible to, to dissociate those with either, either paradigm. So I, I've given you a very specific example of one experiment that we've conducted to examine the role of the IPL in uh, spatial reorienting, but of course there's a lot of TMS research on attention. And I just wanted to give you a very brief summary of, of some of that work. Uh, on the left here we have queuing paradigms that, uh, that manipulate shifts of attention. As, and they can, be, uh, they can include arrow cues, which are strategic and predictive, or in the case of what I just showed you, per, um, peripheral non-predictive cues. Um, we also have visual search paradigms, um, which are becoming increasingly popular in TMS research. Um, for example, in this particular design, the task for the subject is to uh, decide whether uh, a target is present or absent. 
the target here is a misoriented white, uh, white bar, so this would be a conjunction search task. This would be a, uh, a pop-out search task, which is then masked. And down here is a, is a meta-analysis uh, that we published uh, in, in TICS recently, uh, showing which brain areas these studies generally have revealed to be necessary for either spatial orienting, uh, shown in blue, or visual search, shown in red. And we can see that there is a large-scale frontoparietal network that's generally involved, which is consistent with lesion and fMRI evidence, um, frontal eye fields in both hemispheres, um, inferior and superior parietal lobules, and, in, and indeed uh, areas of the visual cortex. Um, so there is a, there is a significantly uh, large body of evidence now um, showing that these regions are crucial for specific attentional processing in the healthy uh, human brain. Now one of the things that uh, really jumps out from a comparison between areas of damage and neglect and the TMS evidence I've just shown you is the, uh, is the overlap. So many of the same areas uh, that are damaged following stroke are those that we find to be necessary uh, in the healthy human brain. But of course the syndrome of neglect uh, encompasses a much wider range of spatial deficits than is generally observable using TMS. The effects of TMS generally are very subtle because you're dealing with a healthy normal subject, um, whereas of course the, uh, the effects of a large scale lesion can be quite profound as demonstrated here uh, in a line cancellation task, um, line bisection, uh, and of course simple drawing tasks, flower and clock and so forth. And as I'm sure you're all aware, um, the, the presence of neglect is a strong predictor uh, of poor functional recovery following stroke. And for this reason, uh, rehabilitation techniques of neglect, of course, are particularly crucial. How do we explain these uh, profound deficits uh, that accompany neglect? The, the dominant model, which again I'm sure many of you are familiar with, is the orientational bias model, or I think otherwise known as reciprocal inhibition model, which it's a fairly simple basic postulate that, that each hemisphere basically controls attention to the opposite side of space and that they mutually inhibit one another so as to coordinate shifts of attention and, and basic spatial representation. But that the left hemisphere imparts in most people a stronger inhibitory effect on the right hemisphere than vice versa, which leads in uh, most normal people to a slight rightward attentional bias. Now, following a lesion to the right hemisphere, two things happen. The left hemisphere, uh, being unaffected and no longer subject to the in inhibitory effects of the right hemisphere, becomes disinhibited and thus overactive. And this can cause what's believed to be sort of hyper-orienting, if you like, to the right hemispace. And because the left hemisphere is overactive, it also is thought to uh, impart hyperinhibition of the right hemisphere, which in turn further pushes down that right hemisphere and makes it and increases the level of neglect to the left hemispace. So it's, if you like, it's a it's it's a compound deficit, not only an over overactivity and hyperorienting to the right, but a, 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 an additional suppression of the left, resulting from a right hemisphere lesion. This has direct consequences for attention, um, which is, I think, most saliently uh, described through the syndrome of extinction, um, which is, I think, generally uh, considered to be a, a less extreme form of neglect. During extinction, um, typically arising from damage to, as you can see here, to a rather large area of parietal cortex, um, subjects may uh, perceive a single stimulus in the uh, contralesional field correctly most of the time, and uh, a single stimulus presented in the ipsilesional field correctly. But when presented with two stimuli simultaneously on both sides, they will perceive only the stimulus on the right. Uh, and it's believed that extinction may uh, be a direct byproduct of this disinhibition, whereby the stimulus on the right uh, further activates the already overactive left hemisphere, which then further inhibits the right hemisphere, which then extinguishes from awareness anything that isn't present on the left. And it's in this context that uh, TMS may be able to step in as a potential rehabilitative technique. This is a, this figure, all these figures are from, that I've shown you here are from a very helpful review paper by Rossi and Rossini, which I highly recommend. Uh, in the context of disinhibition, what if we disrupt the left hemisphere after this person's had a stroke, with the idea being to suppress the overactive hemisphere? 
Okay, so if the di this disin disinhibition theory is correct, then there should be two consequences of disrupting or interfering with the left hemisphere. Firstly, we should reduce ipsy lesional hyperorienting uh, that is caused by the left hemisphere to the right visual field. So we should reduce right perceptual and attentional bias. And we should also reduce pathological hyperinhibition or overinhibition uh, of the right hemisphere by the left hemisphere. And so we should ho hopefully be able to restore uh, processing in the neglected field to some extent. And it's, on this, it's basically this rationale that has led to uh, several recent studies uh, where TMS has been applied to uh, patients with neglect with the hope of rehabilitating their deficits in the contralesional field. I'm going to focus uh, on four studies. I'm going to give you a brief summary of each one. Um, two by Oliveri, Massimiliano Oliveri, who's done some excellent work in this field, and two more recent ones by the same group and a very recent one by Shindo and colleagues. Oliveri and colleagues published probably the first uh, demonstration uh, that TMS of the left hemisphere can, to some extent, reduce or ameliorate uh, extinction. Uh, they examined somatosensory extinction following right frontoparietal damage, and they delivered a single TMS pulse to the intact hemisphere in these patients 40 milliseconds after the onset tactile stimulation. And they had conditions where the uh, tactile stimulation was uh, for one hand or the other and for both hands. And their aim was to reduce extinction uh, of contralesional stimuli by interfering or suppressing uh, pathological overactivity of the left hemisphere. Here is their crucial result. On the y-axis we have the percent of errors. These are omission errors or essentially perceiving nothing errors. And along the uh, x-axis we have the uh, TMS condition, baseline, that is prior to TMS, frontal, parietal and prefrontal stimulation. And they had two groups, a right hemisphere group and a left hemisphere group. I'm just going to zoom into the crucial result here, which is that when they delivered TMS to the left frontal cortex, they observed a significant reduction in somatosensory extinctions, almost 20% in 13 out of 14 patients, which was not observed following uh, stimulation of the prefrontal or uh, sorry, parietal or prefrontal cortex in the same subjects. In the left hemisphere group, the black squares, they showed no effect at all. So basically their results show that in patients with right hemisphere damage, stimulating the left hemisphere, the left frontal cortex, single, single pulse delivered uh, immediately following stimulation, bilateral somatosensory stimulation, can reduce somatosensory extinction. Of course, this is a very transient effect. This effect is not long-lasting. It's, it's timed to the onset of the pulse. And I think for this reason, the same authors later uh, uh, decided to extend their paradigm to a more uh, general framework. Uh, in this case, a more traditional line bisection task that is generally used as a measure of neglect. And subjects, patients in this case, five patients performed a computerized line bisection task where they simply had to decide on each trial uh, which end of this transected line is longer. And of course, if you're neglecting the left side of the display, you're going to more often than not say that the right end is longer, reflecting a right perceptual bias. And in this case, they delivered 25 hertz TMS uh, for 400 milliseconds over the intact or unlesioned parietal cortex, again with the same hypothesis that TMS should reduce the neglect of contralesional space in this instance and uh, reduce right with attentional bias. These are their crucial results, where a positive value here indicates more rightward attentional bias, and the negative result would indicate leftward attentional bias. And you can see in their baseline, the subjects were uh, definitely uh, biased toward the uh, ipsy lesional field. Following parietal TMS, uh, this, they, this rightward perceptual bias was eliminated. And during sham, you can see there's a slight shift down, but it's also significantly higher than, than the parietal effect. So they conclude that, uh, that stimulation of the intact parietal cortex can rehabilitate line bisection, or if you like, right with perceptual bias in neglect. This was in the last study, wasn't it frontal TMS? That That's correct, the yes. Of the so there are inconsistencies in this literature. Uh, in this particular experiment, Oliveri and colleagues didn't actually stimulate the frontal cortex at all. They focused entirely on the parietal lobe. And I think this is an important issue. So per the previous study, they, they had no effect on prefrontal, no effect on parietal, and an effect on frontal. So 
But what where from? Was yeah. In area four or just it's difficult to say. I um uh, their area appears to be superior frontal gyrus, as far as I can tell. Superior um, frontal gyrus. Yeah. Uh, it's not quite it's not immediately obvious from their paper uh, which areas they stimulated. Um, but uh, for example, I, I had trouble figuring out the difference between their frontal and prefrontal. Um, but maybe others know the answer to this. There's a question at the back. Yes. So the, the question is, um, because they used high frequency TMS, uh, would they not have predicted the opposite result? That in fact, uh, by exciting the uh, left hemisphere, they would perhaps even you know, make the neglect worse. Uh, and the answer, I think the answer they would give you is that because they used an online or event-related design, uh, the, the effects of TMS were probably fairly limited to the period of stimulation. So they were, they were, they were if you like, adding noise to the signal using a, a high-frequency design. Um, whereas I think most of the time, in order to show excitatory, excitatory effects of high-frequency stimulation, the, the, the stimulation may need to be more uh, prolonged. You might need, for example, to stimulate for five to ten minutes at high frequency in order to get that uh, uh, sustained period of excitation. I think in this design, because the TMS was delivered simultaneously with the actual stimulus, simultaneously with these lines, if there was an excitatory effect, it was probably overcome by the time locked disruption of that signal. I think that's the answer they would give you. Okay, let's continue on. There's two more studies I want to talk about. The next study, as you'll note from this study and the one before it, the effects of TMS were quite short-lived. We're dealing with event-related TMS of a very specific, through, at a very specific time, a very specific task. And therefore, these results may not help very much in terms of developing a rehabilitation protocol where you want to obviously get a more sustained period of, ch of change in, in the brain. And Bregina and colleagues changed the design in the way that was just suggested in a question, although they used a low frequency design. They had three patients and they, these patients undertook seven sessions of low frequency repetitive TMS over a period of two weeks, uh, delivered at one hertz, so low frequency TMS in order to inhibit processing in the stimulated area for a sustained period after the termination of the TMS. If you like, this is more synonymous with a traditional lesion technique or a cooling technique. Um, and they delivered the TMS over the intact parietal cortex area, uh, I think it was P5 on the EEG grid, um, in order to suppress activity. And they did exactly the same paradigm, they used exactly the same paradigm as Oliveri did in the previous study, line bisection, where a positive, positive result here indicates more rightward perceptual bias in the line bisection task. And we have here four times that they evaluated uh, the, the uh, patient's performance in this task. When, delivered, when administered 15 days or one day prior to the TMS, subjects uh, showed a profound rightward perceptual bias, but immediately after um, the TMS and 15 days after the offset of TMS, um, the rightward perceptual bias remained low. So they argue that in fact uh, a, a regime of this kind can in fact have a sustained uh, uh, effect, a sustained therapeutic effect uh, on these patients. Is there any counter therapeutic effect on the things that the left parietal cortex normally does? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. And that's something I will get to, in fact, when I get to the caveat section. That, in fact, um, what are you actually, what, what possibly are you interfering with? Uh, what, what's the trade off? And if the interest. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> That it's, it's a good point, and, and uh, one of the things that I'll talk about to anticipate one of the limitations is, uh, is that, in fact, in these experiments, there's very rarely multiple tasks undertaken. They usually only examine the task of interest, which is, in this case is a, right, is a line bisection paradigm. Um, so we really do need to broaden the scope, I think, of the tasks that we actually consider when we're examining these effects. It's worth mentioning very briefly that um, they did have one extra task, which was the clock drawing task. Um, and they had this, the patients undertook this task either 15 days prior or 15 days after TMS and they showed that standard neglect was replaced by uh, uh, relatively intact performance, some distortion here on the left um, after, the, uh, after the TMS protocol. 
The final study I want to talk about is by Shindo and colleagues in a very recent paper uh, where they again used a multi-session paradigm of low frequency stimulation over the intact hemisphere. But they measured neglect slightly differently using the behavioral inattention test, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. This test um, has two major components, which contain uh, in turn six conventional subtests and nine behavioral subtests, um, standard measures such as line bisection, uh, line crossing, letter cancellation, star cancellation, and so forth. And from these measures, uh, a score is derived to assess the level of inattention or the level of neglect. They had two, in their two patients, these were the results they obtained on the bit. So the bit C represents the conventional subtest and the bit B represents the behavioral subtests. And here we have, ranging from two weeks prior up to six weeks after, their scores on the bit, where a higher score indicates obviously better performance or less inattention. Um, and they show that, uh, that uh, the TMS protocol, which was delivered here in the gray area, is effective in this patient um, relative to baseline up to two weeks after, and in this patient here up to six weeks after. So their conclusion is that, uh, that stimulating the left intact parietal cortex can impart changes of up to six weeks, which seems like quite a long time in these patients. But maybe it can encourage cortical plasticity and reorganization in a more long-term sense. So to summarize, and this is from a, a recent review paper, which I also recommend uh, as excellent reading, uh, these three studies, these three clinical uh, studies that I've just mentioned, used a total of uh, 12 patients, I think, yes, 12 patients in total, ranging from short-lasting to long-lasting to quite long-lasting effects, um, thera therapeutic effects on, on uh, neglect, reducing that rightward perceptual bias. But as some of you have pointed out, there are some limitations to these studies, and I think this is a good point to talk about them and to consider what we might, how we might improve the way these studies are conducted. And the first thing that comes to mind is that these studies are uncontrolled. Uh, there are, in fact, very few controlled studies of uh, therapeutic effects of TMS. Um, so, for example, if we consider the results of Shindo and colleagues for their patient number two, to what extent might this general improvement have been confounded with normal recovery in these patients? And to what extent might it also be due to practice effects from doing this same test many, many times? Or placebo effects. Without any control, there's no way of knowing what proportion of this improvement is caused by the therapy and what improvement is caused by uh, extraneous factors that are unrelated to the therapy. Secondly, the effects uh, of TMS are often uh, interpreted in terms of attention and or spatial cognition, but that's not necessarily the case either because these studies never monitor eye movements. So the TMS, even if it is having an effect, for example, here, could be encouraging uh, the restoration of ocular motor exploration in the neglected field uh, independently of any covert selection or spatial selection mechanisms. It could be purely ocular motor, for example. In a related sense, it's important, I think, to uh, admit that standard neuropsychological tests, such as line bisection, for example, uh, do not isolate specific cognitive functions. So even though we'd like to interpret the, the uh, beneficial effects of TMS on line bisection in terms of attention and spatial cognition, we also have to face the fact that line bisection can incorporate many different cognitive components. Spatial orienting of attention is just one, visuospatial representation, ocular motor function, the degree to which they explore the line, and if it's the motor version of the task, sensory motor integration. The bit, on the other hand, uh, measures behavior across many different tasks uh, and therefore has the advantage that it characterizes neglect across multiple domains, um, which has been one of the reasons why uh, it's been favored, I think, in the field. But again, th the bit has the disadvantage that each component has fairly low cognitive specificity, components such as star cancellation, line bisection, and so forth, nevertheless incorporate all of these these cognitive processes that in experimental research are always studied in isolation. And finally, we can ask ourselves the question as to whether the therapeutic effects of TMS in these patients may have nothing to do with spatial processing at all. We know that um, phasic 
alert, alerting of phasic arousal and, and changes in phasic arousal uh, can, to some extent, ameliorate the symptoms of neglect, as Ian Robertson showed in his 1998 Nature paper. Um, so we can ask whether, in fact, TMS of the left hemisphere changed their level of arousal in some way or level of alertness, and that it didn't, in fact, correct some sort of spatial mechanism, but simply uh, an effect of brain stimulation. Uh, and because arousal is very rarely measured, and alert, alertness is not measured, this remains a definite possibility. So I think the conclusion perhaps we can draw from, from those four studies is that there may be a mechanism of recovery here, but we're quite some way from determining the exact uh, uh, cause or underlying uh, process that is in fact being, rec being uh, restored. So with this in mind, I'd like to propose um, what I see really as, as ten challenges, ten future directions that this field could go by integrating, perhaps to a better extent, the experimental TMS work that in the sort of area that I do with the clinical work that others have done. Firstly, I think we need more controlled studies uh, with sham TMS. And here's an example of, if you're not familiar with sham TMS, this is me receiving sham. Um, the TMS coil is angled perpendicular to the scalp so that the magnetic field and induced electric field, of course, uh, does not enter the cortex. Simulates many of the uh, artifacts of TMS and for a naive patient, many aspects of the experience of receiving TMS, but of course without stimulating the brain. And this, of course, by using sham, would enable us to uh, factor out basic practice effects in these tasks, placebo effects to some extent as well. It would be helpful, I think, to include control groups uh, who have brain damage but do not have neglect in order to rule out uh, more sort of non-specific effects of TMS on simply people who have brain damage might get better if you stimulate their intact hemisphere. We need to be more specific about the nature of the uh, recovery. Uh, and in a related sense, uh, in the patients that we do stimulate, I think it'd be good to uh, stimulate more regions of the intact hemisphere so that we can start to get a grip on the anatomical specificity of effects. So, for example, if a, if a patient has a lesion of the right inferior parietal lobule, does that mean that uh, a TMS protocol administered to the left inferior parietal lobule might be more effective than one in which the coil is simply placed over a generic EEG coordinate in the left hemisphere? Um, by, by revealing more about anatomical specificity, we're likely to reveal more uh, in useful information about um, the therapy and its application. I think we also need to consider using more specific measures of attention and spatial cognition, as in the experimental work. For example, spatial orienting tasks, visual search, ocular motor control, not just making saccades, but for example, double step saccade paradigms that measure the ability to remap space and update space spatial working memory, uh, perceptual grouping, and of course I think it's important to remember that we're dealing with attention, which in theory uh, of course incorporates cross-modal processing as well. So not just vision, we shouldn't just look at vision, but interactions within and between different sensory modalities. And uh, to, in, in relation to the question I was asked previously, <clears throat> I think it's important that we contrast any the therapeutic effects of TMS with non-spatial functions, such as mechanisms of cognitive control, including response inhibition, response selection, non-spatial working memory, and critically sustained attention and arousal, which we know can have an effect on neglect. And of course the motor system, motor execution, planning and control. These we need to know how specific the effects of TMS are on recovery. Are we just affecting these abilities or are we affecting all abilities? This is important, I think, in a, a critical question which remains unanswered uh, at this point. Now we know, most of us know that neglect can occur in many different reference frames. Uh, not when we talk about a hemispace, what do we mean? Well, this depends on which reference frame you're, you're in. Uh, neglect, of course, can occur in, in eye-centred or retinotopic coordinates, head, body and world-centred space, and of course it can occur in near and far space. And we don't, know, uh, we don't know enough, I don't think, about the therapeutic effects in these different reference frames. For example, in neurophys neurophysiology tells us that uh, areas in the intraparietal sulcus encode stimuli in eye-centred coordinates and some other areas of the parietal cortex in world-centred coordinates, and it might be that by stimulating intact areas uh, that are more homologous in the uh, left hemisphere, for example, we may be able to target uh, particular reference frames more exactly if we measure the neglect initially within these frames. So I think this is a, another important sort of 
axis or dimension in which we should consider it. Number seven, I think we need to consider combining the therapy with other more established methods of rehabilitating neglect. Um, Constraint-based constraint therapies, of course, for motor neglect are, are, are quite popular. Prismatic adaptation has uh, come to the fore recently as a method of uh, encouraging plasticity in patients and, and uh, encouraging uh, processing of stimuli in the neglected hemispace. And caloric, vest caloric vestibular stimulation uh, and also neck vibration and so forth can encourage ocular motor uh, recovery in the neglected field. So we, w wouldn't it be interesting to, cons to combine one of those therapies with TMS and see whether they, can, they are additive or even, even super additive? Just as I was asked before, I think there's been a lot of focus, or a lot more focus, on low-frequency TMS to suppress the left hemisphere, but there's been little focus on using high-frequency TMS to excite intact areas of the damaged hemisphere. And this, um, I believe there have been some TMS studies in motor neglect that have looked at this, but less so in perceptual neglect. Uh, and it's... For example, I think given that attention is, is organized within a frontoparietal network, if a patient has a lesion of the right posterior parietal cortex, it might be that high-frequency TMS of another area within that network that is in fact intact, such as frontal eye field, may in fact um, enable the right hemisphere to resist more the over-inhibition imparted by the left. So you could imagine a treatment regime in, in the future where patients receive low-frequency TMS of the left hemisphere and high-frequency TMS of the right hemisphere to further correct that imbalance. I think in the context of all of this work, it's important for us to guard against so-called bottom drawer syndrome, where uh, work is conducted, clinical tests are conducted, and then not, not published because no effects are found. And this can, of course, lead to massive positive bias in the literature. So I think um, publication of null effects in this field is vital. And finally, there are always more effective and efficient TMS protocols being developed uh, than the standard 1 hertz repetitive TMS paradigm, and indeed more effective than high-frequency paradigms. One in particular that I'd like to finish on today is called theta-burst TMS, which uh, some of you may be familiar with. During the Theta Burst, developed recently by John Rothwell's group at the Institute of Neurology in London, involves repetitive high-frequency bursts of TMS, where TMS is delivered very rapidly. So in this case, three pulses separated by 20 milliseconds. And this train <coughs> is presented uh, at 5 hertz. So one of these trains every 200 milliseconds. And if you repeat this for one minute, you can get profound effects on cortical excitability. In this experiment here that I'm going to show you just now, uh, this protocol was delivered to the motor cortex in healthy individuals, and then TMS was subsequently used to measure uh, motor threshold, a measure of cortical motor excitability, following the TMS. And less than one minute of continuous theta burst stimulation, here shown in the triangles, reduced and suppressed cortical excitability for 60 minutes, which generally tends to be a lot longer than... Uh, uh, than is observed with standard paradigms. So this is a definite hope for rehabil rehabilitation techniques. So I start with, started with this figure and I'd like to end with it. Uh, hopefully I've been able to convince you that some of the approaches that we apply within the experimental domain could be profitably used within the clinical domain in order to generate evidence-based techniques. And I think if this happens, we'll be in a better position to start fulfilling the other end of this, this, uh, this figure here which is to develop cl clinically motivated studies in, in the healthy population. And I'll, I'll end just by suggesting some readings. These are um, four review papers that you might find of interest in this area. And uh, I'll take any questions that you have. Thank you.